scorn, scorn, scorn. Because ultimately, this took a lifetime. 113 teams were eligible for the 2023 Rugby World Cup. By Saturday, the 28th of October, only two remained. Some nations dipped early and others stayed long after they were expected to fall, be it England, Fiji and Wales, Chile, Romania and Portugal, or Spain, Kenya and Algeria, all powered on by an identical, unstoppable, emotional edge. Whether qualifying was the adventure or Web Ellis glory, the ultimate goal, 20 dreams floated through several million minds. 113 became 20, 20 became 8, 8 became 4, and 4 just as quickly became 2. The Rugby World Cup narrowed down to just the sport's greatest rivalry. South Africa playing New Zealand decided the journey that began when Burin Kafaso played Burundi in the first game of qualifying three and a half whole years ago. There was more at stake on Saturday than just a rugby tournament as two Nations United clashed in maybe the most spellbinding, constricting match of the last 10 years. The kind of close game where one missed tackle, one drop ball, one phenomenal pass or unbelievable kick could define a player's entire life forever. A game where no moment would ever be forgotten and one moment could create a legend. This was finals rugby at its Finest. Two exceptional sides playing with top tier execution. A tactical battle so tight. Are his Snyman's shoes look on in jealousy? And ultimately, it was New Zealand left broken. A remarkable, emotional effort by a truly incredible Springbok side playing with a desperation, passion, and need to win that went so much deeper than a first for glory, powering them through a performance that earned every single tear shed on the pitch and across their entire nation. As South Africa made themselves just the second side to ever successfully defend the Rugby World Cup. So how did Siakalisi's remarkable, truly remarkable team raise the Web Ellis aloft once again and what won and lost France 2023's big showpiece event? In the lead-up to the match, I think I was far from alone in labelling this final impossible to predict the tightest call of the entire tournament. And yet, with hindsight now applied, I realised it was never tricky at all. It was the most obvious result of the entire tournament to call. A scoreline we all should have seen coming. Of course, the 2023 Rugby World Cup final was only ever going to be a one-point win for the Springboks. South Africa as a nation has probably spent the last few weeks wishing they produced cardiologists like they do second rows, but there's a good reason why every one of their tests has been so tight, and we can see and how they approach playing the All Blacks. Simply put, New Zealand have been the best attacking team in this competition, making even decent sides like Italy and Uruguay look like rank amateurs whilst opening up world-class sides like France, Ireland and uh, Argentina in the opener, quarters and the semi, scoring an impressive 12 tries over those three biggest games coming into this final. Now, against the quality defence they'd be facing with South Africa, it was always likely the Blacks were going to drop below that four tries a game average, but Erasmus, Nineba and co went one step further, adapting the standard bot game plan to shut them down entirely and wrestle themselves on top in impressive fashion. Of those 12 All Black tries, 9 came directly from line-out ball, sourced from the line-out. Similar to Ireland under Joe Schmidt, the team have infinite adaptable launch plays, simple moves designed to get you an easy game line success first phase so you can play more instinctively after. We're talking stuff like this from the Ireland game. Hooker Taylor, soldier spy, wrapping around late with a runner inside now, hitting whoever's in more space, allowing them to carry over the game line. They're not moves designed to make clean breaks, though sometimes that does happen, just a grand automatic go forward on first phase, allowing the All Blacks to slot into shape and run their incredible varying attack from there. Because what New Zealand have been doing with the ball this last year is kind of genius. In 2023, Fozzie's personal Muppet show have adopted a variation on Eddie Jones' unfortunately not patented positionless rugby system. The idea is to change formation constantly, one or two playmakers managing the shape as other forwards and backs become interchangeable. To go back to that earlier example against Ireland, a few phases on from that launch pad play, New Zealand go through a sequence of carries to get on the front foot, but running out of numbers, Moonga calls for Will Jordan to fill in as a forward here, with Ardi Savea playing scrum half, getting them to an edge so Moonga can reboot the shape entirely because it's easier to set the shape like this from the edge, from the touchline, and he calls something new, him and Jordan wrapping right round and almost creating a chance out here for Yuani and Barrett. If the first carry or two for the All Blacks gets over the advantage line, the momentum tends to just keep rolling and rolling and snowballing until a try comes, because Moonga and Bodhi adapt the shape to how the defence is responding so well, tailoring plays to which defenders are on 
on their feet. If the centre on the feet, they'll set one time to play. If it's the forwards, they'll set another. It's, you know, that kind of system. However, if they don't get those first few carries and the defence gets on top, there's nothing to adapt to and it becomes easy pickings. These repeated mini shapes easier to read for a defence than the more standard grand ones, where at least they've got a safety blanket. In short, in summary, when it works, it's borderline undefendable. And when it works best, it's off line out ball because that's the easiest time to manufacture game line success on your own terms. And so, so much of New Zealand's game becomes about trying to generate line outs and attacking positions. Bowden here says the ball over the box defence's head, and whilst it rolls too long, if it sits up sooner, they're probably forced to kick this out around their own 22. Or from the game's very kickoff, New Zealand run the same ploy they did against France in the group stage and kicked directly to the fullback, half heartedly chasing a bit like, oh no, don't kick it back. Oh, they kicked it right out, they put it out on the full, which is exactly what they're hoping for, and in both cases, Ramos and Valencia do. And from both, the All Blacks run a version of the same play. It's a simple setup, but where against France, Barrett drops it off to Ioani last second, who breaks the line. The Kiwis gamble on South Africa, having watched for that and looking for that, as they send it out the back, but Creo does a brilliant job of shutting this down because he always does, meaning they go to plan B. Wide to Jordan, who kicks his straight downfield to Valemsa, trapping him on a tight angle where he has no choice but to kick it back and give New Zealand another attacking line out. So, if the box were to be successful, they needed to deny New Zealand two things. One, line outs in the Springbok half, and two, chances to generate line outs in the Springbok half. We see a masterclass in doing this following Hardry Pollard's first three pointer of the game. New Zealand land a kick directly on top of Dwayne Vermeulen, the guy who's not going to kick it back, hoping to then pressure the following chase and hopefully make some yardage off it, planting it on the wrong side of the field for left footed Fafta Clerk, making it a nightmare for him to clear, fully aware from these situations the box usually look for touch. However, South Africa don't fall into the trap. Faf turns his entire body to maximise the kick, the defensive line fully set and he sends it long, yet extremely high, in field. Talea is watching and trying to block Arenza, but he's so quick he just veers past whilst he's looking the other way. And while Smith does a much better job of getting in his way, Arenza just bowls into him, sending him over and almost sending him flying into Mawanga before smashing the ball carry of Khaleesi following up to slow the ball down. The All Blacks are on the back foot already, but the full statement comes next. Dutoy makes a fantastic contact because of course he does, before he's tackled assist Malherber deliberately rolls over the top of the ball here, meaning Smith can't get to it for an extra second or two, giving the Bok defence extra time to set up and fly up to smash Ardi Surveyor the following phase. Forey likewise rolling deliberately into the path of the ball, however the moment the tackle is complete he looks up to Wayne Barnes and just starts chatting, a full Shakespearean soliloquy about how triumph as I may I simply cannot roll away, pointing out the leg pinning him in. The ball is slow, Bok D totally on top and Khaleesi once again tussles with Retallic getting in the scrum arse way and then falling, oh no, oh no, what am I what a mistake! Right into Smith's passing lane, it closes off the left hand side entirely, Smith can't really go this way, there's a guy in the way, meaning the All Blacks are forced to go open side. For seven of these eight phases, the box deliberately roll away in the direction Smith is intending looking to pass, just slowing the whole process down a second or two every single time. The All Black attack gets zero go forward and becomes incredibly predictable, the Springboks having so much time, all culminating in Ezebeth here shooting up and making a huge shot. The All Blacks now having lost 15 or 16 metres from when Mwanga originally gathered the ball. Smith left no option but to just for long kick it back to them. This is a statement by the Springboks. We will not give you line outs and we will not give you an inch of kick return. But it's also more than that. This passage begins at 3 minutes 30 inside the box own 22. It ends at 7 minutes 10 with Geordie Barrett scuffing it into touch on his own line. What happens in between is a complete masterclass in tactical kicking. Pollard and De Klerk varying their kicks so regularly with perfect chasers. After Pollard recovers that bomb, De Klerk hangs a direct reply which Aaron almost wins in the air, leaping a amongst All Blacks to almost recover. The All Blacks are going backwards, so Barrett kicks immediately, and the All Blacks set up expecting another bomb. It's coming, isn't it? Barrett and Mwanga back on the 22 with Will Jordan in the main line in case they try anything tricky, which is exactly what Pollard does. Calling their bluff and sticking it into the space Will Jordan would normally be covering, they weren't convinced the box will only bomb it. Going backwards, he tries to offload, but only makes things more of a mess. They just about clean it up, and Smith clears, similar to De Klerk earlier, but instead of hairing up as Aaron did to apply pressure, Will Jordan steadies the chase to remain connected, and it allows Valemsa so much time he links up and the box start the attack on the front foot, total opposite to how the All Blacks had it from a situation that Chase aside was identical a few minutes earlier. The box keep this momentum up over the next few phases, before, as per their go-to tactic in these knockouts, Pollard kicks at the apex of their momentum, the moment they're most on the front foot, and it catches, as ever, Jordan and the Mwanga out of position. Their kick's so well hung you might confuse it for Razi Erasmus, allegedly, both backtracking to try and regather the ball. Mwanga spills it backwards and panic in shoes. Over the last few years, the Springboks have built a reputation as a side who likes low ball in play who like a lot of stoppages because their pack is conditioned for power and appreciate a breather, as we all do. This was something the All Blacks expected to face, wanting to keep the ball in playtime higher themselves. This was something the All Blacks were expecting and preparing for. However, on Saturday, the box recognised they'd have a much easier time defending the All Blacks if they're defending them off kick return rather than off line outs, so changed their tactics entirely, abandoning any usual set-piece focus and selecting a team to suit that. There are a lot of worries about the 7-1 bench, 
how it could backfire on them, but ultimately, it meant South Africa could afford a four minute passenger play like that, denying the All Blacks any lineups, denying them any set piece, denying them that possession and territory, without having to worry about fitness down the road, because they had near enough a full forward pack to come on and keep those tactics up in the second half. All of this is built off how good the box are at chasing high balls, chasing bombs, chasing kicks. If you asked me to name the five best wingers in the world on the kick chase, I'd name you the four wingers in the South African squad and Josh Adams. While Saturday starters may be shorter than Adams on a pimpy, they use this to their advantage on Saturday by just flinging themselves like something out of Angry Birds at the All Black catcher. Colby here is more focused on just getting in Barrett's eyeline than regathering himself, Bodie taking his eye off it and allowing it to fall for the ever tireless Peter Steph the toy. Same thing leading to this chance for Khaleesi, just bloom! getting in the catcher's eye line, a distraction rather than a threat. Combine this with the way South Africa competed for almost every attacking line out, more looking to just disrupt to make the ball ugly rather than win it back, and it starts to have a real impact. The All Blacks had the ball 24 times in that first half, 24 passages of possession, but by my count, only eight of them are what I'd call good or decent ball, where the team aren't on the back foot as they recover it, and hence it's possible to play off without ending up in a situation like the earlier example where the defence is totally on top the entire way, and it just starts to compound error on error. However, if you dig even deeper, Three of those eight were inside the All Blacks own 22, which in a Walker final isn't exactly an ideal position to be launching an attack from. This gives the All Blacks just five realistic chances to get their attack going over a full 40 minutes. The All Blacks scored points off two of those, but the Bok defence shut down the others incredibly quickly. Whether it's the pressure they're putting Mwanga here leading to a moon howler from him, or Dutoy and Moster here alert the danger to try to catch them off guard with a quick throw. And yet, we still did see one extremely close moment on one of those five in that first half. After a few front foot phases, Mwanga calls a simple shape. He hits Geordie, then loops with Ioani running a great dummy line to take a pop and flick it onto Bowden. They don't make much ground, but four Bok tacklers have gone to ground, been taken off their feet, trying to stop this, both centres committed, and Colby making the final hit. Philemster comes up from the backfield to cover Colby's wing, and as the All Blacks play another phase, both box centres are still getting back up to their feet, and just join the line on the short side, just to get into position immediately. Delande gets sucked into the play as an extra forward, as is often his role, whilst Philemster tells Creel to watch the wing while Colby's still getting back up to his feet, allowing him to head back into the backfield, where Faf's been covering in his absence. Frizzell carries, but with Ioani into layer and threatening positions out wide, Pollard screams for support, so Faf goes, right, okay, and jumps up to help him. Aaron so then jamming into the 13 channel, and Philemster taking his spot on the wing to watch this. Except the those two leaping in has left a huge space in behind that no one is covering. Jordy Barrett spots this and runs in ahead of Artie, who's about to carry, giving him a call. Fully aware that both centres, who normally is part of the South African system, turn to cover chips, are out of the game over there. He drops it onto his wrong foot to allow him to engage both Pollard and the clerk better, and it's a beauty. Lands perfectly. This ball could bounce in 100 different directions in 97 of them. Surveyor is scoring a try in the World Cup final, but in a moment of universal bad fortune I can only explain is what karma for Surveyor frowning at a dog last week or something. It sits up for the spring box instead. The All Blacks knock over a penalty from this, but it's very much three points instead of seven in a game they lost by one. Because here's the thing, the All Black attack is so good, even the best defence in the world, which is what they were up against on Saturday night, can probably still only stop them maybe eight times out of ten. So the more lottery tickets they buy or passages of possession they can play off, the more likely they are to hit that triple rollover and score the critical try. And so the spring box did everything in that first half in their power to close the corner shop, to hide the tickets, to get rid of the little blue pen, make sure the All Blacks couldn't put their lucky numbers down on any piece of paper. But you never count out the All Blacks. Joe Schmidt yet to be had the tactical conundrum he couldn't solve, and after half time, the All Blacks came out completely different, adapting their kicking game to totally cancel out the Springbok approach, leading to so many more chances to buy those tickets. Moonga here spots Vilemsa has come up into the line to shut off the space and sniffing, smelling of delicious 50-22, tries to put it in behind him. And whilst the fullback can cover it, it's a pretty remarkable effort. He spills it on route and has to panically then turn and recover and hit it back, opting for the safe warm safety touch, lovely touch blanket of touch of a line out. But instead of leaning on one of their big starter plays, New Zealand from it slap it to Surveyor, who smashes it up the middle, easy does it, before setting up to kick immediately. Now they're on the front foot, with South Africa still backpedaling. The clerk covering the wing with Colby the backfield does a great job of blocking Will Jordan, allowing Cheslin to take it cleanly, but he's still under pressure, soon tackled, and whilst the box play one phase to let him get back up on the feet, he's only just in position when Declerc clears it, and Colby knows that. Not up to speed in time, and just decides to set the line instead of chasing as usual, because he won't stand a chance of getting there in time. This has given the All Blacks exactly the kind of open field they spent the entire first half searching for, 
Bowden launching a counterattack and a free All Blacks flashing blind late as a block. Colby now drops slightly deeper in case he's needed in the backfield and Geordie extremely square to fix for Mullen and Malherba, allowing Jordan to put Taylor away down the wing does a lovely sidestep in the process. Jordan himself then clears out, allowing Smith to play immediately and the other All Blacks to get into shape around them. Knowing how light the defence is, Peter Toy makes probably his only mistake of the game and bites in on Big Barrett, giving away a penalty. Which eventually leads to the position for the try for Bowden Barrett a bit down the line. By kicking whilst they're going forward repeatedly, the All Blacks took the South African chase out of the game, forced the winger to remain half dropped at all times on defence, granting more space for them to attack and caught out players still finding their positions over and over again. After a phenomenal carry by Surveyor here, Smith once again kicks immediately, and whilst Talea is travelling in a straight line, Arensa has to travel some 20 metres and dodge about sideways a bit and try and adapt to try and work out where the ball's going to get near it, and then he loses the contest in the air. As part of the play, NZ set free fours behind Talea to clear out if he retains it, and the quick ball this generates allows the All Blacks to play looking to exploit the fact the wing is on the floor. Surveyor and Barrett time their balls perfectly, but De Klerk once again does an amazing job of just jumping out of line to spook Moanga, making him shit himself and drop it with a clear chance on the cards. All these opportunities coming because the All Blacks started kicking on the front foot instead of forcing the play against a world-class defence when it wasn't on. Because, man alive, what a defence! I think the moment that sums this up better than any other is perhaps this. Off the only attacking line that South Africa give them in the entire game, unforced, Geordie Barrett has a gorgeous touch dropping off to Iwani last second, who rips through the game line like it's a cheesecake and he's ox and shell on Christmas morning. Dutoy, representing the professional athlete diet and the metaphor, catches up with him, but despite Fori's best efforts, the ball is fast and Mawonga has set shape so quickly, granting the All Blacks an overlap you can't really see because of the camera angle, sorry about that. But hey, I'm just glad to be using footage. Now, normally the spring books will have Colby jam in and attempt to make a big hit on Mawenga before he can get the pass away, whilst most players would be taught from being a kid to just kind of back off and wait for the attacker to make a decision so you can commit afterwards and just finish whoever has it off. But Colby just trusts Creel. The centre is having to watch both Surveyor and positionless rugby in Talea, filling in as a forward, but Colby trusts him to mark Mawenga as well, allowing him to blitz Bowden and Valemsa to watch Jordan, cancelling out the overlap. The pass is panicked and Jordan knocks it on, all because the spring are not only so good on defence, they just inherently trust each other to do an outstanding job. There's no need for individual glory or to make a big play when you know your teammate is going to go above and beyond. Colby here can make a perfect read and force the error based on what he believes Creel's best case scenario would be, rather than worrying it'll be anything less. And ultimately, he's right to do so. And frankly, he's had very good reason to believe in him over this whole tournament. Creel was one of just a number of Springboks playing out of their skin on Saturday, as he has all World Cup. It'd be very easy to do a full 5-10 minutes on every great defensive read he made. 10 minutes on how good Dion Ferri was, who is, incidentally, the same age as your dad, and yet came out of nowhere to have the game of his life in a World Cup final, having come on after two minutes. Or half an hour we could easily do on how bloody almighty Peter Stefter Toy was for a second World Cup final in a row. How many players can say that? Probably just Richie McCaw. If there's such a thing as rugby values and Bill Beaumont broke down my door last night, climbed into my bed and held me as I went to sleep telling me how much you like my hair just to prove a point that you wouldn't get that in other sports. That level of respect doesn't happen in other sports. People don't break into your house and tell you how much you like your hair in other sports. I reckon it looks a bit like this. A brilliant line out here from Metallic and Jordan just ships it on knowing the box aren't set for defence. As such, Arensa is caught between the fact he's too narrow to run his user defensive role and just running that user defensive role, so Barrett waits with the ball in hand for a moment for him to decide, patiently biding his time, calling Arenta's bluff! <laughs> Instead of allowing his salad-sized mate to make a terrible choice, Peter Steph the Toy commits a murder for his friend, and he doesn't even need to hide the body because it's completely evaporated on impact. That, to me, is rugby values. And man, this tackle. While I think it loses something if the cut between camera angles when watching the stand, yeah, I was at the game, I'm really sorry to bring it up. He seemed to materialise from nowhere like some holy apparition answering Springbok fans' prayer, a plague of Dutoy upon all your houses. Whilst the All Blacks were equally packed with exceptional stars. Ardy Surveyor was a, his, you know, usual 9 out of 10 that just serves as usual for Ardy. The front row were fantastic across the board and the brothers Barrett all excellent, but particular mention has to go to Mr. Geordie. This extra effort to roll the Alande over the line and hold him up to prevent a springbok try or even the chance before the threat could even really arrive would be a highlight if not for the phenomenal job he did covering open side flanker for 50 odd minutes. However, whilst he contributed his weight into scrum extremely well to deny a single springbok scrum penalty, a real rarity, and mixed it around the park when necessary very well, the box still found other ways to work their one-man advantage offset piece. From the first scrum after Sam Kane's card, the All Blacks line up with their backline as usual, seven in the scrum, 
Barrett still in the back lane. So the Springboks go, Lekker, let's bully the shit out of them. However, Wayne Barnes decides the plums are looking too spicy, so calls things a second, at which point the All Blacks wake up from an awful, terrible dream they just had, where they were wearing white shirts in a World Cup final against the Springboks, and they just let them have total 100% scrum dominance for the entire game, and Andre Pollard had a field day, and it was... God, it was... Chesney Colby popped up at the end to score a try, but Pimpy scored one as well. Oh, God, he isn't even playing with it. What a dream. It was, it was horrible. So they quickly avoid the shit stains on the bed and call Geordie Barrett in to join them on the blind side. They're not going to risk that happening here. Now, as Barrett walks in to join, Pollard calls the clerk back and changes their call. The box backs all set up differently by the time the ball comes out. The All Black D, which is a phrase I don't recommend you Google, is now missing their defensive leader off first phase, and Pollard knows that means they'll almost certainly play the safer option of a drift defence instead of their preferred option of blitzing. So, Pollard calls a move to exploit this. It's pretty simple at heart. Every box back is paired up, one running a hard line with the other in the boot that space at the back, with Vermeulen picking and going to create an even number as de Klerk's buddy pal pal buddy. The Alande's line is excellent and takes Morong out of the game. Creole's line pulls Ioani in tight and Damian Willems' inward angle not only attracts the attention of Talea, but he then gives him a little push as well. Cheeky. The ball goes behind to Colby. Barrett left no choice but to come up and join the line, opening space behind for a little kick. Aronson can't quite get there, but it's pinned the All Blacks right back, and from the eventual clearance, Valemza attempts to drop goal, and after Bodie clears, Colby sends another stunner at the opposite corner, once again looking to pin New Zealand in their own half, just keep them down there, keep those 24 passages as unplayable as possible. Jordan gets smashed by Dutoy, the dictionary definition of bad ball, and as the All Blacks attempt to get back on their own terms in order to clear, Vermeulen can sneak in amongst the ruck and win a huge penalty, which Pollard promptly slots over. A huge moment in the game. However, the next time the Springboks have an attacking scrum, Pollard seemingly calls the same shape, calls the same move, and the All Blacks adapt, sliding Will Jordan into the fly half position and moving everybody else out one to let them shoot up and shut down this play. However, the curtain raises and the play begins, but instead of hitting Pollard in the boot, Diolande skips the scene entirely and sends it out to Colby. New Zealand now only audience members, forced into a drift defence they didn't want to be running. Colby dummies the same kick, then passes to Valemsa, the final straw to bring Bowden up once again, sliding in the kick now. An incredible <laughs> attempt by Arenza, almost resulting in a try that would have sealed the game. What an attempt this is, frankly. What a bloody go he has of this. And so, we fast forward and we end up with 10 minutes to go, the mighty All Blacks, the most successful side in the sports history, pretty undisputedly at this point still, are baffled how they combat this one pretty simple strike move that Springboks keep pulling time and time again. This time around, they opt to go for kind of two and a half man defensive line with Talea already half dropped for the kick. Andre Goddamn Pollard, to give him his full name, takes one look at this and goes, they're going to go for a hard drift. So they run it nice and easy, simplest variation yet, bringing Aronser in direct, squaring and straightening to make some 25 metres off the simplest trick in the book, but not the oldest because that, it gets even better. That comes here, simple hands down the line in the dying minutes, looking to gain enough yardage that they can start thinking about setting up for a drop goal with just minutes left on the clock. Easily exploiting the extra man by calling hands down the line in a World Cup final. What is this? 1987. No, they're just a man up. Because we do kind of have to address it. After only one card in nine previous finals, we saw these two teams quadruple that count on Saturday alone. Most notably with the first ever Rugby World Cup final red card to all black captain, Sam Kane. Now, if you're frustrated with the red card or of the perspective that red cards dampen occasions or ruin games, then by all means, get angry, be angry, stay angry. But don't direct your anger at Wayne Barnes, at the anonymous official in the bunker, I always like to think of the TMO's mum, or at the game at World Rugby. Direct it at the fact that the all black captain hasn't learnt how to tackle. If Sam Kane went into a tackle with this technique... We would all criticise him for it, because if you tackle like that, you not only look like an idiot, you're going to miss the tackle, and it might lead to you conceding a try down the road. For five years now, tackles where a player enters upright and leads with the shoulder have universally, worldwide, resulted in yellow and red cards. Every player in the World Cup knows this, and yet Sam Kane still tackles like this. Quite simply... This is unbelievably shit technique by Sam Kane. There's no need to take this risk. He has every chance to go low and instead he stays upright. That's the core difference of the tackle from Khaleesi in the second half. For one captain, it's a timing issue. He's bending his hips, trying to go low, but he hits just too early. For the other, 
they've walked in with a technique that they, as a professional rugby player, should know puts him at best at a 50-50 risk of getting a card every single time he tries this. Is it deliberate? Is it malicious? Is it an attempt to injure? No, of course it isn't. It's absolutely not. But it's bloody stupid. Maybe the stupidest player of a World Cup where Thomas Lavanini started six games. Concussion is an existential threat facing this sport, and more importantly, every player who takes the field. There's an issue bigger than even this, the biggest match in the sport. And the facts of the matter are, most teams have been coached properly to adapt. It's five and a half years now since Wales last had a red card, while Scotland, South Africa and France have had reds for other offences, but none for dangerous tackles because their players are coached properly to go low. Same deal with most of the tier two nations in this competition. There's no excuse for the All Blacks. New Zealand now leave this tournament as the least disciplined side in the entire World Cup, despite the fact Argentina literally exists, having garnered more reds and more yellows than any other team, because they, like England and Japan alongside them, have failed to teach their players how to properly tackle in the current climate. I have huge amounts of empathy for Sam Kane. I'm not sure anybody in the sport's history has ever been dug a hole so deep. A captain set for scapegoating, forced to watch the final from the sideline with a camera shoved in his face, hoping to catch his snot on the lens and tears falling, left forever with one of those moments that will tragically define his career, define what has been a phenomenal career. But ultimately, this is the correct decision and it comes down to a moment of poor technique, poor tackle choice, poor judgment, and most importantly, extremely poor coaching that led to the All Blacks, the game's biggest brand, playing most of a World Cup final without their captain. And yet it didn't stop them playing, not for a single minute. If anything, the All Blacks going up a gear, with South Africa potentially starting to take them lighter. The All Blacks able to leverage those chances, work their magic, and create a beautiful try on his final appearance for Bowden gosh darned Barrett, who put Kane's bit of history aside to create his own. The first man to ever score tries in multiple World Cup finals. And this try is built off everything New Zealand have been doing well this tournament. The lineup ball is clean and more strong. Taylor opting not to break off as Will Jordan, part of the backline setup, sprints in to aid the effort by adding 1% extra weight. The moment Wayne Barnes throws his arm out to say his hit catch phrase, advantage, a call comes from the backs and Jordan spins back out of there, only actually pushing in the mall for four and a half seconds, that's wingers for you, but it's enough to shift the Springbok defence's perspective. Seeing NZ's most dangerous player commit to this mall is enough to convince them New Zealand are all or nothing on this mall, so the box set up like this, three men able to blitz out knowing they're marking one guy only each, for them so watching the extreme, but Jordan jogs around late and changes the picture entirely. Suddenly, there's a guy they can't mark, forcing, once the ball comes out, them to readjust. Colby pushes out, meaning Creel has to stick to Mwanga, and Diolande has to adjust last second as Barrett drops off a lovely short ball to Yoani. Faf, meanwhile, reads the play and begins to mirror Jordan, but changes his mind seemingly last second having flashbacks to a bit of analysis done in the week, because this stinks of a play New Zealand ran against Ireland in the quarterfinals. Off a mall here back in time, the team run a few smash-ups in field to get between the post and last second, the backs wrap round here as so and lob it right out wide. Ever since the mall, Ardi Surveyor has been hanging around on this wing, just, just waiting here, just lurking. The All Blacks deliberately not involving the best carrier, so when the time comes, he can be in position to finish as well, scoring a crucial try that goes on to win them the rugby match and game and get all the way to the final. So, when Surveyor sets on the blind side and Scott Barrett joins him here, an extra man outside Colby, Faf assumes they're running a variation on that play and hairs it to the short side, has to watch this. This manipulation leaves the box light in the middle and allows Yoani to smash over the game line. One more carry, then coming to let the backs who had to clear out find their feet as Mwanga calls another narrow close shape. Once again, assuming Nina Burrs had the box doing their research. All World Cup long, New Zealand have made huge yardage, off Geordie Barrett popping short balls to Yoani last second, as well as using Will Jordan as a playmaker, including in the example Faf was daydreaming about 10 seconds ago. Moanga's simple ball here takes out the forwards, Creel trusting himself to double job Barrett and Yoani, but Arenta has to watch Jordan, leaving Belemsa with two men to cover here, and he's just waiting, he's trying to buy his time knowing two passes is enough time for him to pick which one's getting the ball first, with De Klerk still on the blind side. Expecting a short pass, the box aren't ready for Geordie to instead throw the long, looping pass over the top. Belemsa left in a terrible terrible position to make the tackle now, and Talay able to slalom in and out of defenders coming across, still finding their bearings. However, the Springboks didn't bet on 
Bowden. It's now been over a decade since Bowden Barrett made his All Blacks debut and seven since he started changing the way teams attack worldwide. The fly-off position forced to adapt to what he brought to the game. And yet the guy himself remains so able to adapt himself, changing his game and changing positions whenever the call came. And this score demonstrates that. Cut out the move, Bodhi keeps himself alive. This doesn't look notable, but it's one of the best support lines you'll ever see. Barrett instinctively and instantly finding the exact spot that's furthest away from defenders, yet closest to his teammate. That triangulation, meaning even the hurry dropped pop pass off the floor, is enough to get him out and over the line for a try his career could not have deserved more. Bowden Barrett retired this week as an all-time great, a legend of the jet black jersey. And yet, I also think he's more than that. Bowden Barrett retires an entire generation's favourite player. A guy who didn't just make fans admire, but fall in love. This final game didn't go the way he wanted, but I'm so grateful we got this try as a chance for the world to look at Bowden Barrett one last time and say thank you. Because here's the thing. From his try onwards, the All Blacks had several chances to go on and win the game. A his conversion, his brother's pot shot, and any number of breaks and solid positions from around the park. But instinctively, both live and watching the game back, I just feel like the Springboks would have always found a way to get back ahead. Once the margin fell to one point, they changed their whole approach. Once the penalty for penalty suddenly became second place, the Springboks adapted their entire defence. The system remained in place exactly the same, but the tackle choice changed across the board to minimise penalty risk. Where previously, the box was slowing All Black ball through skull duggery, rolling away tricks are talked of, or the likes of Vermeulen and Foree competing when it was perhaps legally dubious, knowing Wayne Barnes generally gives a warning to players before penalising them for rock-based offences so they'd have a chance to let it go and feign their innocence. They instead became squeaky clean now. Adopting the tackle tactic, Wales used a fantastic effort in the pool stage, the Bonks would look to make more passive double shots, one guy stopping the ball has momentum, whilst a second goes in to wrap up the ball, meaning whilst the ruck is fast, the time between contact and ball away is massive, so defence can still fully set. Other than one risky dalliance from Jean Klein, every phase here, South Africa go for double hold-up shots, until it reaches its logical conclusion eventually with the ever-remarkable Quacker Smith stripping the ball and turning it over. This all allowed South Africa to just lean into the pin-back tactic as the game reached its conclusion. Suddenly very happy to give the All Blacks lineups, but exclusively in their own half, all underpinned by the work rate personified by Faf de Klerk here with two and a half minutes to go, making a chop tackle on Ioani before popping right back up to his feet to charge down Finlay Christie, trapping New Zealand in their own 22 with the clock eeping away. It's the kind of thing the Springboks did all day, because this Springbok performance wasn't about rugby, at least not entirely. This wasn't about a team going for glory, trying to be the best in the world. This was about something much more. For I don't think you can truly understand, truly analyse, truly discuss this Springbok team without talking, at least in some detail, about the captain. A man who, henceforth, should be known worldwide as the great Sia Khaleesi. This moment has been shared around quite widely since, but for me, nothing captures why the Springboks were able to secure three back-to-back one-point wins against the greatest of opposition and adversity better than this. Seconds, mere seconds after final whistle goes, after a landmark achievement only previously reached by one man in history, Khaleesi ran straight over to Cheslin Colby. Ever since his yellow card late on, Colby has been a regular fixture on the big screen, jersey soaked, eyes awash, unable to watch, tears running down the green and gold. Khaleesi's first instinct isn't to celebrate with those most elated, but to pick up those lowest down. He holds him, cradles him. This isn't a hug of celebration, it's deeper than that. It's one of genuine love that, that pulls Colby back enough that he was out on the pitch longer than any other player once the trophy celebration was done. Erasmus and Nina were built a rugby team who can beat anyone, but Khaleesi has added something else, something more. In 2015, we saw what a Springbok team built on determination can look like, but in 2019, and now again in 2023, we've seen the team built on something much greater. The name Sam Tanda roughly translates to We Love Him. And whilst it couldn't be more true, I think that title only begins to sum up what Sia means to South Africa and brought to this team. You can motivate a side, motivate a person based on shame, based on anger for a little while. You can motivate a person by looking to prove doubt is wrong or become the best in the world to reach full potential for quite a while. But when a person is motivated by love for the people around them, I believe there's no barriers they can't overcome and no limit to how far they can go or how long and hard they'll fight. The name Siam Tanda 
roughly translates to we love him, but that love goes both ways. Seer Khaleesi, in a way beyond every other captain in the game, glows with love for every single one of his teammates. He loves, he cares, and he would die without a second thought for all of them. Maybe Ibn Ezebeth can be taken to another level by making him angry, but there isn't a human being on this planet who wouldn't play and give everything for Seer Khaleesi if he took you in. Because he leads not by words, but by emotion and by action. By the way he plays, yes, but by comforting Colby, by letting Fori continue leading, being the guy talking to the referee when he returns from the Simbin period, by bounding out the tunnel at the end of the Mika concert, not with a steely focus, but excitement and energy to play with the guys he loves so much, and for the nation he deeply cares about. I said in my preview of this game, if the Springboks win on Saturday, Sia Khaleesi deserves to be remembered as the greatest captain in the history of the game. The truth is, even if the Springboks had lost for me, his status in that spot was never under threat. Even if we put his remarkable life in the background, other captains may have their strengths and achievements that should not be sniffed at, but Sia Khaleesi brought an unstoppable emotional edge that transformed his team into more and gave his nation hope. This is a team united in a way few in the history of the sport ever have been, because their captain went through the unimaginable and chose to fight for something better and always be better. He doesn't shout or scream. He leads with a kindness forged over a long life of seeing the opposite and knowing the thing that got him through those days was empathy and hope. 113 teams were eligible for the 2023 Rugby World Cup and ultimately only one stands victorious. And it feels fitting. Fiji, Portugal, Argentina, England, Chile, Wales, Algeria, Kenya, Spain... The teams who really transformed this tournament and its lead-in, the sides who performed above expectations are, across the board, in every single example, those who played with hope and with love, rather than with steel or with fear. And so to see Sia Khaleesi, a man who embodies the dream, who came from the most unimaginable poverty, the most hopeless situation, and rose slowly to become a titan, not through his physicality with his gritted teeth, but through his willingness to empathise and understand others, and then work harder for what he's learnt and who he now has to fight for. A man who learnt resilience from the most impossible, horrible places, and grew from every mistake he ever made. And a man who deserves to be remembered for so long as this game is played, at a minimum, lift the sport's ultimate prize for a historic second time, feels... Fitting, perfect, and just. There are a dozen players in South Africa who could have capped in the box at this Rugby World Cup, but there is not another player in the history of the game who could have got the sheer depth of emotional performance out of his team that Sia did. Bonds built over his six years as captain, now even greater than they were when they won the World Cup in 2019. Fires forged in the toughest times, creating those one-point wins, creating those desperate tackles by Arenza, double efforts by Duclair, mighty hits by Dutoy. Because ultimately, this took a lifetime. Thank you for watching that. It's been a long World Cup. It's been a long lead into the World Cup of those 20 preview videos as well um this brings it to an end this brings it to a close this brings the rugby world cup 2023 finally in words i never thought i'd say it's over it's done uh we did it we, we can it now end. discover what sleep is that some people do i've heard that rumor i highly doubt it uh we recorded a version of this at like 3 a.m the morning of the world cup final um we were both incoherent <laughs> and more so than usual overcome. yeah um but Thank you to every single person who's watched these videos over the last four years leading into this, leading up to this, and then, you know, again, over the tournament. Obviously, it hasn't been ideal up until now with the World Rugby Footage situation. Uh, if you're Bill Beaumont and you're watching this, um, Rugby Values. Keep up the good values. Keep up the values. And this great game. You're doing a wonderful job of uh, spreading the game, um, and don't let... Um, yes. Keep it the for evidence, the elite. Don't Bill. let the evidence tell you otherwise. Keep it for um, the elite. So, yeah, if you're anyone else who watched it, then, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for watching. A lot of work's gone into this. A lot of work went into the 20 videos to preview the World Cup beforehand. Um, it's been a hell of a thing. 
Um, it's been exhausting. Um, Travelling around France as well. A lot of rugby. Uh, so much rugby. Thing. So much rugby. We've had to watch and including, don't get wrong, we've enjoyed a lot oh, of it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially Pro Day Doe. We went to a Pro Day Doe game yeah. in the middle of the World Cup, which was incredible. Um, but yeah, so thank you as well to, you know, obviously we were in France for a very long time. Um, I was there for 10 straight weeks. You popped home in the middle, but you're still there for a long time. Yeah, it was a good decision. <laughs> um, but thank you to everyone that, you know, came up and said they enjoyed the work or just, you know, said hi. Even, you know, the guy who said he doesn't watch the videos. Uh, all of you, you know, every single one, thank you, really meant a lot and really appreciated. Um, and thank you to everyone that let us know, you know, that looking forward to this video and looking forward to the others. Hopefully, done it justice. Hopefully, we've done, you know, something of some value and worth rugby value um some rugby value thank you bill for popping in here um yeah so this brings the world cup to a close we're going to take a break we're going to stop for a while um we are going to do a couple of bits before the end of the year we've got the moments of the year coming up and the team of the year coming up which obviously the moments of the year is always a huge undertaking we start that literally in january <laughs> yeah. literally first of january we start on the, on the moments of the year 2023 for anyone who doesn't know every time we watch rugby and something mildly noteworthy happens we take a note of it we discuss yeah. it go, and then it goes through a process it's a whole thing the long list is currently over 100 pages long um, and you're fitting like 20 30 odd things on each page so it's a long it's a long list it's it a, long, a long long list, list. um so yeah, that's all coming up. We're going to take a break in the meantime. Um, Not and... watch men's rugby for a bit is my plan well, personally. You know, we'll 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 see. We'll see. We'll <laughs> see. Um, but thank you to everyone. Yeah, that that came up said anything that thought you know you <laughs> recognise us. Then went actually, I'll I'll let my own personal space. That's also appreciated. Um, but yeah, everyone. Anyone who's, who's left videos, hateful anyone comments, who's left hateful. Thank you, Ken, and thank you to the the, the rest of you. Um, please have a wonderful remainder of the year have a time until we see you next and as ever if there's one thing i think is well well worth saying and worth celebrating and worth shouting and screaming about it's the, the fact that there weren't any dogs on the pitch this one there cup. weren't any dogs on the pitch this fucking stupid i don't i don't know how that happened i don't know what happened i'm it's furious graceful. about it um we won't get over it but what we did see on the pitch instead was players a lot of Play, players grass grass um lines marking mm -hmm. uh balls a few of those balls some real balls um being dropped off the field as well yeah um and uh values ultimately i didn't see any of those no personally. well do you know what i did see what rugby, rugby. football union code game Thank you for watching that. We are currently at Franklin's Gardens, the home of Northampton Saints. Victor Matfield played on that pitch. Um, for reasons that become very clear soon, we've... George Furbank played on that pitch. George Furbank plays on that pitch currently. Yep. Not right now, he was on that this morning. Um, reasons that become very clear, we've been speaking to someone very exciting, we'll be looking at that very soon. Um, are we been cleared off this? No, we're not. So, thank you for watching that. It's been a long time coming. Um, that video got taken down the morning after it went up, hopefully. You seeing this, you're seeing this after longer, further forward than the morning afterwards. Um, yeah, it's been a long kind of battle and fight to try and get this up. Hopefully, it's going to stay. Fingers very firmly crossed. But firstly, thank you to anybody who kind of petitioned for this to Absolutely. come back. Everybody's kind words. Anybody who kind of fought for just rugby content existing, people wanting to see rugby, uh, because we're very passionate about that. And it's nice that other people are as well. So thank you for supporting the channel, supporting just rugby generally. It does not go unnoticed. Thank you. Thank you enormously. Thank you very much. Um, please, you know, <laughs> this video went up um, in October. Please go, if anything says badly, I apologize. If anything says really well, I take full credit. Um, <laughs> And, and I take some of the credit, thanks. like twenty percent. Uh, no, <laughs> so 49. Um, 40, 40, 51. Yeah, right. Yeah, deal. Wait anyway, a second. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this is just to go on the end, and let's go play some rugby on that. Pitch. Let's go and play rugby on that pitch with Victor Matfield and George Fairbank. <laughs>